I want to open open this breakout session the same way as we opened yesterday, which is with an acknowledgement that we're on indigenous land, on Ohlone land, um, which we want to acknowledge uh, in all of our work at the Haas Institute when we bring people together. Um, the name of this session is What Can We Do With Elections? And our goal is to explore how, as organizers, as researchers, um, donors, culture makers, strategists, all other forms of allies that we have here in the room, um, we can get creative with election seasons. And we can have goals that go beyond changing who sits in office to more transformative change. Uh, not just winning transfers of power, but winning changes in the way power operates. So we know that in the United States, uh, turnout rates, participation rates are low by global standards, and we know a lot of the reasons for that. Too many people feel that no matter who wins elections, things don't really change. And too many people have a lot of memories of times when they thought they won something and ended up feeling disappointed or feeling burned. Um, but there's always a lot in play in election seasons. There's a lot of resources, there are platforms, and there are opportunities in those. So we want to talk about um, what are those opportunities and how do we use them to the best advantage so that people feel like they're using elections instead of being used by elections. And um, we have three uh, fantastic speakers here on the panel today with me. Um, they're, they're experts on answering these questions. They're experienced and insightful. Um, but we're not just going to listen to, to the experts, even though we are going to do that. We're also going to split up and have conversations um, and bring together the, the collective experience in the room. Um, so, so basically the format is going to run like this. Um, I'm going to say just a few words about our three panelists here. Um, each of them will speak for about 10 or so minutes. And then we're going to have four stations in the room uh, marked out by some white paper with four different topics that I'll mention after our speakers have spoken. And uh, the four of us will facilitate smaller discussions at those stations, and you can go to the one that speaks to you the most. So without further ado, the first uh, on this panel that will speak is uh, Crystal Zermeno, um, who has led the Texas Organizing Project's multi-year electoral strategy, grounded in year-round organizing in black and brown communities to build capacity and win power locally <laughs> and statewide in Texas. To, uh, to Crystal's left, to you all's right, is Dewana Thompson, who is the founder of Think Rubik's and the mastermind behind Woke Vote, a voter engagement program that mobilizes and strengthens black institutions all across the South, and did some pretty important things in 2017 in a Senate election. Um, and finally, we'll hear uh, from Melvin Willis, who's here to my left, uh, who's a city council member and f uh, recently vice mayor of uh, right, right here in the East Bay in Richmond, California. And Melvin has worked with Alliance for Californians for Community Empowerment, ACE, to drive issues like rent control and raising the minimum wage. And through his organizing work, uh, found his way into public office. Somehow. <laughs> so, okay, I'm <laughs> yeah. So I'll give it away to Crystal. Hi, y'all. Um, so I'm going to just take you a little bit down um, the path that we took at the Texas Organizing Project. We've been around now for 10 years. Um, we are in Houston, which is Harris County, Dallas, and San Antonio, also known as Bear County, B-E-X-A-R, not Bexar, but Bear. Um, so, you know, after the 2010 election, we were asking ourselves a pretty simple question. Who isn't voting? To us, it seemed like a very logical question. If our goal was to have a reflective democracy, then, you know, this democracy should actually look like our state. Um, but the interesting thing was is that's not how the electoral game is played, right? People really are just looking at the electorate, those people who are actually voting. And so candidates and operatives were only dealing with that existing universe. Um, and really writing off low propensity voters. And so when you think about a state like Texas that was growing, is growing demographically at a really rapid pace, 
and no candidates and none of this consultocracy, as we call it, <laughs> of consultants were actually speaking to those voters, it became this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. So I was asked a number of times, all the time, why are Latinos not voting? And I'm like, well, if you don't talk to them and you don't outreach to them, they have no idea there's an election, then why should they vote? And no, none of the candidates were really speaking to their needs. Um, and then you layer on top of that our history of white supremacists and voter suppression laws um, and practices. And we were pretty much dead last or second to last in voter turnout and had been for a really long time. Um, and so, you know, we are at our core a community based building organization. So we organize in neighborhoods, black and Latino communities mainly urban areas, um, but our people in Texas are just in a world of hurt, as we know in a lot of states across the South. I mean, even in states like California, <laughs> but especially in Texas, where we were just really under, um, you know, decades of repression. And folks, you know, we're dead last in a ton of different categories, education, healthcare. Our people were literally dying they're being poisoned by oil refineries that are literally in their backyard. In the city of Houston, there are no zoning laws in that county. And so you will literally have a house with a refinery right behind it. And so we knew that if we were gonna save people's lives and give people the opportunity to change their own lives in their communities, that we had to be fighting with two fists. So we had to be in the electoral arena and we had to be in the community organizing arena. But we also knew that we had to build a roadmap that was going to be a strategic use of resources and also organizable because texas is a behemoth it's a huge state and if we were going to chip away at that apple and get some governing power for our communities we had to be able to figure out like the most direct path to get there that was also doable and executable um, and we knew that also that we needed to be cha creating change along the way so people needed to be engaged in the fight, they needed to have something at stake, and they needed to be able to win something. Because again, when you're living in a state like Texas, which I, poor joke, but I said that when Trump won, now everybody's gonna learn what it's like to live in Texas. Um, so, <laughs> so people had to, you know, believe that they could win and believe that change was possible. Um, so again, our problem was that we needed a roadmap, we needed people to see that change was possible, and we needed infrastructure and resources. Um, so you know, we spent a lot of research time looking at the voter file, looking at our state, looking at demographic maps and change, and really got at this question of who wasn't voting and where were they. So we found that the most efficient path was through nine counties. These counties are huge. Harris County is 4.5 million people, yeah. over 2 million registered voters. Um, so they were bigger than battleground states for the most part. <laughs> um, but we, we discovered that there was a combination of large numbers of registered non-voting folks of color um, and single women and sort of this rising electorate of young millennials. And there were significant numbers of unregistered. And so we had, we identified a path. Um, and then we knew that also in those counties, what we had was the opportunity to actually win some governing power. So you know, a lot of folks will think about the state house or they'll think about the state legislature. We were gerrymandered out. Mm -hmm. Democrats couldn't win anything, progressives couldn't win anything, and it was pushing Democrats to be questionably progressive. Mm -hmm. um, so we knew that we needed to also start to shift and pull where we could. So we looked at all of the building blocks top to bottom and discovered that in our cities, we could actually win progressive councils, progressive mayors, we could take over the criminal justice system through our district attorneys and our judges, and we could win at the county level. And so we really started sort of chipping away and having a vision of where we could build power and aggregate power and start to shift a progressive agenda that was changing our communities sort of from the bottom up. Yeah. Um, so we started to identify that path um, we took our plan 
on a road show. So for those of you who are sort of in the donor world and also those of you who are running organizations, it was critical for us to really take our plan, present it to people in a way that they could see that we were you know, that we, I'm going to use this word, but you know, that we knew our shit, right? <laughs> we often don't get credit because we're a nonprofit organizations and we're not consultants and we don't understand this world. But we did. We had done the research. We were sophisticated in our analysis, strategic in our targeting, and we built out a plan that was rigorous. We were extremely rigorous in our execution and in our work. And so we took that on a path through Texas, we took it on a path nationally, and started letting people understand that we can actually chip away at this beast, that there were groups on the ground that were invested and doing it with relatively little support and resources, um, and that we were starting to really win in a collaborative way. Um, but I do wanna, I wanna focus a little bit more on what I think is our greatest strength and success, which is really how we built out our work um, and it's kind of concentric circles so you know our base was always our target organizing turf and so when we started back in 2009 2010 we were very neighborhood based um, and we we always made and centralized our organizing turf in any electoral work that we were doing so that was foundation number one and then we started just sort of building and burgeoning out from there. So we were looking at the ISD races, the city council races, again, sort of rooted in our turf. And so as we started growing and hitting multiple cycles, multiple cycles, we were basically blossoming outward. And always, again, hitting that same turf, adding more turf, hitting that turf, adding more. So now, I would say after the 2018 election cycle, in Harris County, where we had done the most extensive work, most of our geographies had gotten nine hits from our organization and leaders over nine cycles. So we were engaging in statewide races, in federal races, in dis school district races, and in uh, local municipal races. So we were building a relationship with voters, and we were building capacity in that turf. Um, we also, um, you know, built our team from inside of our geographies. So for some reason in our heads, we always thought that we needed to find somebody from the outside, especially after the Obama race and there were all these people that were trained. But Texas was not sexy. I don't know if it is now, maybe it is, but, <laughs> but we couldn't find it. We were like, we got to bring all these people in. They can help us up our game and run these programs. And we were recruiting and nobody. So meanwhile, we were just building it. Um, and then we started to realize, actually, we're saving ourselves. <laughs> and we have the capacity and the infrastructure. And that goes back to our organizing model. So Kimberly Olson, my colleague who's in Dallas, I think runs one of the most rigorous programs in the country, arguably. She's very methodical and mechanical and, and runs um, you know, our paid and volunteer operation with a lot of integrity. Um, and so she was really building and training a whole body of experts. And I think Dewana will speak to this a little bit, but um, you know, when we run our programs, we're infusing millions of dollars back into our neighborhoods and communities because we are hiring people from the neighborhood and engaging them in our organizing. So when you looked at our 2018 um, operation, our county coordinator was a local Latino who had been working on elections for decades and does year-round immigration organizing. Latino immigrant, um, I would venture to say that in most instances, he probably wouldn't have gotten a second look on his resume in a major campaign. Um, but he was running an operation of you know, 150 people in Harris County. Um, statewide, we had actually staffed up to about 350 in addition to our regular year-round staff. Um, by 2018, 50% of our leads and human resource staff um, on our campaign operation had been with us since 2014. So they were there 2014, 2016, some of them in 2015 as well, and then in 2018. Um, and then on, I remember the first day in, in our Harris County operation, 50% of our Canvas team had come back. So a lot of folks actually call us up and like, it's election time, we're ready. And so they're training each other 
in that session. And you forget that it's actually, it's a, politi it's a politicization in itself. If you think about how many people we're touching through our operation who either are directly impacted by the criminal justice system and can't vote, but they're outreaching to their family, or for some people was a first time voter. Today our criminal justice statewide director, um, originally from Dallas, she first came to us in 2014 and it was her first time voting and she came through our canvas operation. So the other thing that we're doing is we're building an organization out of folks that we get to touch when we go broad on the electoral organizing work. And so um, I think at one of our staff meetings we looked around and it was somewhere between like, I think about 50% of our staff had actually come through our canvassing work. Um, and so we also do, um, member meetings, so we sign folks up as members when they come in through either a Canvas or phone bank operation, bring them into the accountability work. Again, we have to remember, um, when we did the 2016 Dallas, uh, Harris County District Attorney's race, um, you know, that was the focus. It was a presidential election, but we knew what mattered in our neighborhoods and what we could directly impact. Were, were that people were getting stopped, people were, their families were getting put in jail, they were losing their jobs, all, that we really needed bail reform. And so that was the main message on our doors in our neighborhoods. And most of the people that we were canvassing, or that were doing the canvas and canvassing had been directly impacted. Um, and then when they were able to have those conversations on the doors with voters, they were able to have, you know, legit conversations. and really from a place of understanding. And so the other thing that we do about our operation is teaching people to lead with their own story, right? And to talk about why they're doing this work. Um, and so, you know, the other thing I think is that we are able to build, you know, we have a more diverse team, right? Women, folks from the neighborhood. Um, and then we bring folks back around. Um, so, one of the women uh, who was a canvasser in 2016, the, the opposing district attorney, um, a pretty conservative Republican woman, one of the things that got highlighted in the campaign is that she had jailed a rape victim because she wanted her to actually testify. So she put her in jail um, to keep her there. The canvasser came up to me that night and was just crying because the same thing had happened to her daughter. And so, to just understand, you know, that she had not brought that up to anybody during the election, but she was so invested in the campaign itself, and then became very invested in the accountability afterwards, right? So once we got that district attorney elected, we were immediately not just turning the voters that we contacted and our existing members and leadership, but new folks that we were engaging in the community in the fight for accountability and change in their neighborhoods. Um, and so I guess, I, again, I just kind of wanted to, it was a little bit of a meandering story of the different components, but I just wanted to, you know, to point out that as the folks are thinking about both investment and their programs themselves, that you really just need to look within at the raw resources that you have and the importance of investing in that because it stays in your neighborhood, it goes into your organizing, it, it is much more powerful when you have the elected official standing in front of people that helped get them elected because they knocked on doors, because they were part of the organization and the organizing. Um, so I'm probably awesome. out. <laughs> I always hate coming after Crystal because she, she is so dynamic and the work that they're doing over there is incredibly important. Um, we've had the privilege of being on several panels together over the last couple of years. I'm glad I went before her. No, <laughs> no. Um, and what I always find, and I think you're probably finding this as you are matriculating through this conference, is that there's so many of us who are doing work that is complementary that our network is really us. Right, and taking the time to strengthen those relationships is a part of building those creative resources. So I just wanted to highlight that and thank her for the work. And thank you all guys for being here today. Um, so I am not an overachiever. I want to say that first. Um, I was asked to do a PowerPoint. Um, and then I slaved to do it. And then they were like, oh, it did really matter. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, yo, y'all getting this PowerPoint today. Okay, so. 
So that's where we are. Um, I don't even know how to make this thing go. You Listen, this is hilarious. Um, how to make it actually do a, a I don't because this is a. You just click the next slide. Okay, so it'll stay up like that. Okay, fine. So. My name is Dewana Thompson. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I hail from Birmingham, Alabama. And yes, the South, it is rising again. Uh, if anybody tells you differently, ask them to come talk to me. Um, but I am a, a, a partner in the firm Think Rubix, which is a social impact firm, um, global social impact firm. We um, are really, really excited about creating solutions um, that help people research um, effectively, um, organize effectively in communities of color, particularly in the South. Um, we also do public programming, uh, partner engagement, all those kinds of things. However, um, what, brought, what brings me here today is I created a program called Woke Vote. Um, it came out of the opportunity that we had to ensure that Roy Moore did not become the next senator from Alabama in 2017. Um, you can clap for that. We thank God for that. Um, thank you. For that. <laughs> thank you. Um, the thing is, though, um, I tell people all the time is that if you are not already connected to community, if you've not already been building, uh, working with the people on the ground, when you get these opportunities or these moments, it won't matter because you won't be able to push past um, all of the things that are happening to actually secure the win or to actually bring people in. So if you are not doing that work, if you're not rooted in the community, if you're not already knowing who the Miss Joneses are on the block who can tell everybody, listen, we going today. Like all of that, like if you don't know that already, if you haven't taken the time to invest in that, build that, if you get an opportunity like we did in Alabama, it won't happen, right? And so I'm glad to say that we were able to do what we did because we were rooted already in our communities. We knew who did the work on the ground. We knew where the, how, we had already power mapped our entire state. We never left our states in the sense that, yeah, you can leave and go pursue other opportunities, but you stay connected to the leaders. You stay connected to your families and all those things. So I was living and working, um, quite frankly, at the DNC, when uh, 20, and during 2016, I was uh, I left the White House, I went to the DNC, and um, it basically occur occurred to me that I was gonna have to leave traditional spaces for the rest of my life. And the reason why is because I felt like there was a lack of intentionality, authenticity, integrity, that I was being asked to lead with. And it's not necessarily because I think that those things don't exist in those spaces. The reality though, is those things are not funded in those spaces. They're not prioritized in those spaces. And I don't know about you, but at the time I was a 34 year old black woman from the South and people were dying every single day. They still are. There was just so many critical things that I felt like I could not exist in a space where I couldn't number one, speak truth to power. Number two, call people out on their BS and number three actually have the power to divert the resources to the actual programs that I knew would work on the ground if I cannot do that I have to go and so my first thing to you would be to say if you're in spaces where you cannot be authentic if you cannot actually do the work that you are called to do you may want to consider why you're there because we decided to build something else. And so we were trying to ask some very critical questions and those questions were things like this now, if you see this uh, meme over here, it's one of my favorite. It says, I'm looking for a moisturizer that has the fact that I've been tired since, 19, since 2010, but really since 1983. Um, but I think that we can all agree with this. And here are some of the things that I'm tired of. How many times do I have to tell these people the same thing about my community? And by people, I could quotations, the same about, in quotations in my community. So we'll talk about that. Why are they surprised by losing if their strategy is lost? Why is there no money for me to build in my community, but there's money for me to build for a candidate? Why are the organizers and political leaders from my community not recognized as professionals? Why do you expect people to vote for you and you haven't invested in them at all? And as the young people say, why Sway, why? Right? And that's when we started to think about how we had to do something different. We, as Crystal talked about, um, bringing people into a space that they already feel is a burning house, people are running away from that house. They're not firefighters, 
They're not running into it. And so we had to figure out a way to build power for people in a way that doesn't say that you're building for a candidate or for an institution. You're actually building power for the liberation of your own communities. And so we tell people all the time, we don't, um, we don't owe anybody our power. We don't owe anybody. They get to benefit from our organizing. They, we don't owe them our power. And so what exactly happened in Alabama? And we won, right? And here's a snapshot of our numbers. And this is important because as we're talking about creative use of resources, one of the things that I think is very important is that organizations that are grassroots organizations, homegrown organizations that come from the ground are oftentimes the last people to get any funding, right? But we do crazy things on the ground with the <laughs> smallest amount of resources, right? We always have to the point now where we think it is okay if somebody gives us $25 to run a GOTV program for eight weeks. It's like, <laughs> are you insane? Like, you know, what, is, what does that even mean? And we do this because we love our communities, right? And so in Alabama, we had basically four, five weeks or six weeks to come up with a program that I have been asking people to donate to since January. We got our first dollar on October the 6th. Wow. Yep. We were literally about to put Roy Moore in office and we could not get people to give us a dollar before October 6th. No matter whether, I, and I have, I've had 16, actually 15 years of work in this, in this, uh, in this arena. I have, wor I worked for both President Obama campaigns. I worked for Cory Booker and got him in the Senate. I've done all the work internationally. I've organized all over this country. I've won up and down the ballot, including in my own state, because I started, got my start in municipal government in the city of Birmingham, doing public programming on behalf of our 99 neighborhoods. I know this work. I literally begged for nine months. And you know when they made the decision to invest? When someone told them, oh, it looks like it's possible that there's a path to victory. But that path to victory is only going to happen if black people turn out. I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been saying that since January. I had to stand up and say that in, in one of the rooms. And I had already built the strategy. I had already talked to the people. I literally presented it five to six different times. Only for somebody to come back and tell us later on, like, we never saw that. We didn't know that there was a strategy on the ground. We didn't know that people were organizing. I was like, this is the birthplace of the civil rights. You don't, what do you mean people aren't organizing? We have a history of changing this country. You should invest in us because we know how to liberate people. And so we did. So we did all of this. <laughs> 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 but what we find is that people are more than numbers. You have to forgive me. I'm an organizer and I like to stand up and my shirt is cute today. Um, <laughs> just is what it is. And so the thing is when you're bringing people in for something, the way we were able to actually bring in 100,000 new black folk, getting them in, engaged or energized about this election had nothing to do with Roy Moore or Doug Jones. In fact, we never used their names. Not one time. We never did. We told them, this is your opportunity to build black power. This is your opportunity to find the resources for your community. We told them, we will not bastardize you after this campaign. This is a start. This is an entry point. This is how we're going to organize ourselves to get the resources and all the things that we need beyond the election. And we came to our community in so many different ways. One of the things that I tell you, and, and, and we'll talk about this in Creative Use of Resources, is that when the resources finally did come, they had so many stipulations. I wrote the plan. I'm from Alabama. I've got the people in place, but you're telling me that your people from, who've never even been in Alabama are the ones that are going to execute on the ground? Unless, if I want the money, that's how it's going to have to come in? So we're having to make decisions about whether or not we take a stand on that or whether we bring the resources in and try to leverage this opportunity for you know, a stimulus package for our community, right? And so I chose the latter because th that amount of money, we, ra we raised a little bit over $4 million um, and we're able to get that in. And that amount of money had never come to Alabama, particularly only to organize black communities, right? I couldn't say no to that because I knew how creative my people are. I knew that when we get four million, it was gonna be like 10 million, right, on the ground. 
because my mama can take one dollar for a whole month and you and still have 10 cents at the end i'm like i don't understand <laughs> i've never seen it right it's a southern thing i think or a mama thing i don't know um but i also knew that people asking people to do a campaign where it wasn't rooted in culture was not going to last so we did so many different kinds of things and we told we were trying to get the funding for that and the people who finally did come through with the funding, they didn't agree or believe in the culturally rooted stuff that we needed to do to bring people in. So we had to create woke vote, not because we weren't gonna do that a part of the strategy, but because in order to actually have the resources to do the cultural piece, we had to build a whole other campaign outside of that campaign. How many of us have had to do that before, right? It's like, the cultural stuff should be a part of it, right? Why do I have to do that? However, people could see themselves in this. It became their campaign. And so we had to, we had promised people that we were going to stay with them, right? How many of you know that most times after the campaigns leave, all of that, we never even see the, we did all of this work, all this data, we never even see these people again. Nobody calls them, no follow-up, no nothing. And that's from anybody's campaign, black, white, whoever. It doesn't happen. So we just basically built power for what? Right. It's gone. And every cycle, we then have to kind of come back and drum it up. And we were like, that makes absolutely no sense, and it's not a true investment in our communities. And so we promised that we were coming back. We started a fellowship. And this is our first graduating class of our fellowship right here. So we're excited about that, 55 fellows from seven different states in the South. Um, and with the mission to invest in long-term long organizing strategy, right? The activation and the training of those individuals. And not only did we create our fellowship, we had a statewide uh, conference 90 days after we had our event, after our election. Actually, not even 90, it was in February, right? And we brought back all of these new people who had organized for the first time, all of these new leaders who had taken a chance and stuck their neck out. And we said to them, we're now going to take the time to invest in you. We're now going to take the time to build out your power and make sure you understand what we just did in six weeks together. We're now going to make sure that if you've got a program, you're connected to each other in your communities and your neighborhoods, right? We're now in 2019 and those same folk are still organizing, whether it's an election or not. They have built true community, true power for themselves. And so really quickly, what does it take to win for our folks? And one of the things that we tell people is that early resources, particularly in communities of color, stop coming to our neighborhoods three minutes before the election. <laughs> literally with a hot dog and it's like i don't even eat that like you know and it's offensive right like it's absolutely offensive and so um but it's also reflective of a traditional space in the system that says i don't need you until the very end or i'm not going to invest in you early enough to actually allow you to build for yourself i'm just going to invest enough to get what i need for my win so we're we're taking we're, we're moving out of that so then we talked about a non-traditional strategy focused on cultural organizing, which I told you before, which, in, um, which had us using you know, or working with students who owned their campuses. We didn't tell them what to do. We, we, we researched with them. We said, hey, here's an opportunity. We gave them the money, and they were coming back. Ms. D, we're going to do this on our campus, and we're going to do this on, in our neighborhood. Not one time did I have to worry about whether or not they were going to hit goals because they owned it, right? They were the woke vote coordinators on their campus. And they're the ones who are still coordinating today. Access to clean data. We don't get the money to research our communities. We don't get the money to study ourselves. We don't get the money to organize. Maybe in some places, but particularly in Alabama, in the South, we don't get that money to do research. And so there's no clean data. So half of the time, we are spending our time literally trying to clean lists that have not been cleaned in a state like Alabama in over 15 years, right? And so it's an issue with that. I'll come right back to you. And so what we had to do then was invest in a, a system that allowed us that once we were organizing, knocking doors, phone banking, all of that, <coughs> that we went back into a clean system, right? And that we have ownership of that. Strategic partnerships, an increased amount of independent expenditures. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the creative session decentralizing the candidates and focusing on the voters, digital and tech strategy must align with the strong, strong ground game. Listen, 
especially if you're trying to organize anybody under the age of 45. And really, my mama is 60, and she'd be on online more than I am, okay? <laughs> she literally knows what I have on today. Um, and so I was like, how do you know that? She was like, I saw you post it this morning. I was like, oh, okay. Um, she watching. Um, <laughs> but amplification. We can knock on a thousand doors in a day, but social media can talk to a thousand people in less than a second. You have to incorporate that. A vision beyond 2018, and this is tw beyond 2019, all of that, the reality is if your program is only existing for that snapshot of the election, it is not an organizing program. It is not a community building institution. Access to te technology and redefining playing in red and rural areas. And the last thing I would say is build your campaigns with three months after in mind. Now, I made a decision in my work, in my, the people that I work with in my firm, my partners, one of my partners is here today, Chris in the back. Um, we made a decision that we were gonna be radical about the way in which we ask for money. I'm gonna tell you up front that even though this election may be in December, half of this money is gonna be held over for programming after this. Because I know if I don't tell you, you're gonna feel a certain kind of way afterwards. But you don't get to tell me what's important for my community. And so when that money comes in, I don't care what it is, a percentage of that has to be held for the after part. Because it's not, at this point, we don't know if we'll ever get the chance to ask for, the, for money again. So we've got to do as much as we possibly can with those resources when we get them. Pitch a holistic strategy, not a GOTV program, right? Pitch the fact that this program is going to organize for our communities. Ensure that there's follow-up. Center people closest to the pain and make them the managers. We'll talk about that. Think of campaigns as many stimulus opportunities. Hire the block. Use elections as entry points and the ability to build your organizational leadership. We don't always get to send people to othering and belonging conferences. We can't afford it. What we can afford to do is organize ourselves in ways that builds the leadership of our people on the ground and allows them access to, to, to learn more about and strategize how to become better leaders for their community. Link the win to something other than the candidate, wow, wow. because if you don't link the win to something other than the candidate, it moves, dies, breathes, whatever, with that person. So if they lose, everybody feels like they lost. If they win, it's like great for the candidate, and then what? If we never hear from them again. It was all about them. It was never about the community. Link it to something else. And then power map for long-term strategy, right? Once you do all, take all the time to do all these things, it makes no sense if you're not going to liberate your communities for the long haul. Don't bring people into something that's dying for it begins. Most elections, all elections have an expiration date. They are dying when they begin. Bring people into something that's going to have a lifespan and tell them that the election is just a part, it's just a comma in our program. It is not our program. Thank you guys so much. She asked what clean data means. It means, um, so when you have um, voter material and all of the information that we use to knock doors and phone banks, a lot of times those lists are, if you go knock on somebody's door, they don't even live there. The data's not clean, right? So it's, not it's not pure. It hasn't been updated. It's, it's, you know, I tell people I've knocked on doors of people who are literally deceased and they're still as a voter in Alabama. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So y'all want me to follow up after her? I said, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but my story, how I got involved in all this works. So let's just say, fast forward to my 28-year uh, life. Let's just go back to when Obama first ran. Now, the reason this is significant is because Obama was the first person who was black that was running for president that actually had an opportunity to win before people actually knew he would win. And everybody was excited about him. You would hear it all through in the high schools. You had people walking up to me before I even had a chance to vote saying, oh, when you turn 18, are you going to vote? Are you going to vote? This is important. This is historic. And my answer actually at that time was no. I'm not going to vote when I turned 18 because at the end of the day, I surmised and identified at a very young age that there were a bunch of people that would step up on TV or in front of you and say, I promise to bring jobs. I promise to bring affordable housing. The economy is gonna be better. We're gonna end homelessness. And after the elections, I'm looking around like, what, what happened? What happened to the promises? And then on top of that, I didn't actually knew no one ever taught me or told me because I had a non-political family. They don't necessarily, they 
teach it in school, but let's face facts, public school education and public schools are completely underfunded. So they didn't really tell me how far my vote actually won. They didn't tell, no one told you where to go to do research on candidates. It's like, as soon as you turn 18, it's like, for me, all I knew was that I could vote for a president. I could possibly vote for a mayor, but I didn't know where the mayor was. And I didn't even know about all the ballot initiatives and ballot issues. The only ballot initiative I really paid attention to back in 2008 was Prop 8 because it was messed up that they were telling people that if you're in a same-sex marriage, you couldn't get married. So that was the main one I paid attention to, knew that you could vote, and that's the main thing that upset me. But... So my contribution at that time was ripping down all the signs that says vote yes for this proposition. <laughs> that was my contribution. <laughs> didn't need to vote. I just made sure other people didn't vote for it. <laughs> but that goes into my point is I got passionate about an issue. I gave some level of involvement, even if it was vandalism, because of an issue. <laughs> Now, fast forward to 2011, I was looking for a job. Um, I ended up dropping out of college because financial aid wasn't getting to people because the recession had hit. And a random text message came in say, hey, be $12, get paid $12 an hour to go door knocking in the community. I'm like, yes, I could do this. <laughs> $12? And you pay on time, too? And you actually take out taxes? And there's an actual timesheet and not just ambiguous, like, send me a text message of your hours and maybe I'll pay you this week? Sign me up. And the first place they sent me to was, you know, everybody has a part of their city where, you know, it's just known that you just don't go there at any time of day. Or if you go there, stay there for five minutes and leave. That's the first place they sent me to in the city that I grew up my whole life. I was like, wait, you're sending me where? You know, the joke where if you walk around a block three times, you're going to end up shot. That's where you want to send me. That's how I identified with that city. But what I ended up realizing and noticing was that Actually getting out door knocking and talking to people, this is a place called North Richmond, I realized that people felt the same way I did. I realized all this false fear that was surrounding me forever was unnecessary. I mean, it didn't help when I door knocked somebody and they said, it's 6.30 at night, what you still doing out here? You need to go. I mean, <laughs> then a couple times I ran out of that area because they almost like the residents told me to. But I still seen people care about the community, they cared about community blight, and they actually wanted to show up to a community town hall meeting where they would have a chance to meet their mayor and another city council person, and at that point, a police chief too. These were folks that I didn't even knew existed, or I knew they existed, but I didn't know who they were because I never was involved in politics at the time. And no one ever told me who they were. I had to find out because of a community meeting that I was invited out to from my job and that I invited other people out to as well. And just hearing the energy of the crowd was that people were excited that their public officials were going to be there, but they were mainly excited to make sure that the issues that they were facing in their community were going to be heard and that they had a chance to deal with community blight and those issues. And what led from that town hall meeting was the very next year, a vacant property ordinance was put on, a vacant property registration ordinance was put on the books. So if a property goes vacant, the city can keep track of it to the best of their ability and send code enforcement out to hold the owner accountable. That was just like one step where I actually started to believe in that some movement could actually happen. It went from, you know, if I get involved or vote for this person, they're really not gonna do anything to, hey, I actually seen people show up to a community. I actually seen people sit in front of 250 people in a room, sign on to a platform and vote on that platform and continue to work with community members. So all that's to say is that for the past seven and a half years, I only work on issues that are issues-based issues. I only organize around issues. When we were talking about rent control or just cause for eviction, I was reaching out to tenants that either got anywhere between a hundred to a thousand dollar rent increases or who were dealing with unfair evictions because the landlord wanted to kick them out for complaining about the mold that their kids were suffering from or the fact that their heater was broken and it sent them to the hospital with carbon dioxide poisoning. Those were the issues I was working on. Or working with uh, people in our undocumented community 
who were afraid to speak up, but they didn't have access to health care. But when I showed them and told them that the County Board of Supervisors were going to be voting on a program that would be free basic health care, regardless of immigration status, people showed up and they shared their voices and they pushed their supervisors to do the right thing. There was actually one person who was a swing vote. And you know what we did with that one person? I ended up going out to Antioch in 106 degree weather, stopping people right there saying, hey, do you believe everybody should have health care regardless of immigration assistance, uh, immigration status? Yes, good. Can you call your county board of supervisor right now before they vote no and more people have to suffer? And they would sit there with me, dialing from my phone, leaving them a voicemail saying support health care for all regardless of immigration status. So for me, if you're really going to build political power, you need to control the narrative. You need to actually reach out to people and find out what are people facing on the day to day? What are tangible solutions that we can all organize around? And how are you holding your public officials accountable? Hold them accountable. They ran on a platform. They ran wanted to represent you. Hold us accountable because one of the things that I see, and this has actually upset me a few times, since I've been in office, I'll come across people in the community that shake my hands like, oh, it's an honor to shake your hand. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, don't glorify public officials. They are not special. We are here to work. And the fact that it has been polluted and manipulated into this way that people feel like you have to be a special kind of person just to be in office is what has disenchanted a lot of people, in my opinion, from wanting to participate because they feel like you have to either be special or that their voices are not going to matter. But being able to pass rent control, being able to pass health care for the undocumented, being able to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour, being able to pass a county program in one of the most conservative counties, actually, in California and pushing people to vote for that showed me that there, there, there is real power in people. There is real power in organizing. There's real power in holding officials accountable. And there's one issue, and I'll wrap it up right here. Uh, there's a state law called Costa Hawkins that limits cities from having uh, rent control, full rent control. There's a cutoff date up until 1995, and all single family homes are exempt. In 2016, there were so many cities that had rent control measures because the affordable housing crisis that we're in. Richmond was one of them. Mountain View was a second. Alameda, Oakland updated theirs. That a statewide a coalition of folks came together across the state of California to say, we need to address this affordable housing crisis. We have in these wins locally, but how are we bringing that collective power in the state? So people came together in 2017 and in 2018 they had so many housing bills because of all the lobbying all the narrative and all the base building that was happening statewide they had so many bills around housing that the legislators that we were lobbying looked at us and said that i've been here for a while and this is the most bills i've ever seen on housing because statewide we pushed the issue we organized the base we got the data we showed the racial and economic inequity and we brought the victims of this racial and economic inequity to the media and to them to share their stories. So it painted people in the corner like, which side you on? Which side you on? It's like, uh, uh, wait, wait, what? Huh? Uh, what? To where even though last year Costa Hawkins repeal was on the ballot, $74 million raised by corporate landlords was spent to kill it. However, even though that was a very sad winter break, this year with the new governor and with all the narrative and base building that did happen last year, this year our new governor was calling for a rent stabilization package. And you know what I was just lobbying in Sacramento about yesterday? Reform of Costa Hawkins, which exempts buildings that are younger than 10 years old, statewide rent stabilization for a cap of 10% if you don't have rent control across the state, and statewide just cause for eviction so you can't be kicked out for no reason. This had nothing to do with me as a candidate. It had nothing to do with them as a candidate. It had everything to do with people and the organizing that was happening and the power that was being built to hold elected officials accountable, and that's where we get real community power, and that's how you get people involved in elections. Don't. Don't say, oh, Melvin's a great guy. Say, no, this issue's on a ballot, and if we don't show up, it's, we're still going to be taken advantage of. Your neighbors at our stake, your lives are at stake, and all you need to do is show up, and these are the victories we already had from showing up, and we're going to have more.
But Melvin is a great guy, too. <laughs> so I got here somehow. Um, so we're going to try to uh, do something that gets everybody involved. We've got these four uh, basically just sheets of paper on the wall right now that we hope are going to be populated with ideas um, from different folks in the room. And so we're going to split up. You can select what station you'd like to go to. Over here, we're going to have a little discussion, a little interactive bit um, that's going to be moderated by Dewana on creative use of resources uh, and leveraging resources from non-traditional sources or in non-traditional ways. Uh, Melvin will be uh, moderating over here a discussion of how to get issues onto the agenda that aren't there, take advantage of platforms that exist around election season to get issues on an, on an agenda. Crystal uh, will be moderating a discussion back on the other side of those, whatever this little thing is here, um, on uh, building for future governing power. So um, how, you, how you're building in such a way that you have the leaders and um, the capacity and the power, the independent power uh, to, to govern when you win. And I'll be in the back against the back wall um, leading a group on kind of uh, uh, a variety of other uh, opportunities for having spaces, uh, creating parallel spaces in parallel to election cycles for, um, you know, culture, belonging, um, alternative uh, participatory practices and systems. So. Uh, split up real fast. We'll spend about 15 or so minutes doing this, and then we'll have about 15 more to ask questions to the panelists afterwards. All right, if we do have questions for our wonderful speakers, Dewana Thompson, Melvin Willis, and Crystal Zermeno, um maybe put your hand in the air, and I will either bring you the microphone or you can tell me that you can talk loudly. Okay, real question um, for Ms. Thompson. Um, I had a question regarding uh, your fellows that you, you've been mentoring. Are mm -hmm. you getting them involved in party politics at all? So asking them mm. to be delegates for like the state or national convention coming up and if, why or why not? Yeah, so um, that's a very complicated question. We are very careful to not indoctrinate people into I would say traditional spaces like the party, but we are we do make them av uh, aware of all of the opportunities that are available for leadership, right? So right now, for instance, the party, uh, the, the Democratic Party is doing the organizing um, court thing that they're doing. It's interesting, it, it makes me a little nervous, but they are, you know, it's a resource attached to that $4,000, right, for an organizer who, or a young person who wants to learn how to organize. I come from a place where some people don't see $4,000 in a month, right, and so, it would be um, unrealistic for me not to say, here's an opportunity, but we've trained them in such a way that they know what questions to ask when they go in and that they're gonna make a, a, cr a crazy amount of noise while they're there. So um, if that's the case, if that helps to answer it, the answer is, yeah, we don't, we don't, we're not training people for the party, right? The party can benefit from our experience if they wanna hire our organizers or hire our fellowships or our fellows, if you will. The second thing I would quickly say to that is that, um, however, when you look at issues with like voter protection inside of the voting polls and the booths, right? We are um, activating around the idea that we need to change out the people who are working in those spaces. We need to change out people who are working in election offices. We need to change out people who are working inside the offices of political officials because those are the people who are a lot of times playing with the power and the access to the resources and the access to the power. So yes, in that case, we were telling people, run for this, go do this. You know, uh, these are opportunities. Does that help? Okay, great. Other questions? Uh, I think I'm loud enough. Um, <laughs> this question is for Melvin. I'm just curious if you could describe the process to which you had your aha moment or if there was a specific moment to where you decided to get into politics because as soon as you talked about vandalizing, <laughs> the, yes, I'm like, yeah, um, but obviously as you get older, there has to be some type of <laughs> Everybody was young at one moment or so. <laughs> no, um, it wasn't actually a aha moment, and this goes into the joke I said that, um, you know, somehow I got here. Uh, there was, just because the work I've been doing as an organizer, showing up at city council, showing up to spaces, and just being a participant, a lot of folks just started to 
like and believed in the work that I was doing and they uh, seen me for good leadership opportunities. So folks when I was 24 were saying you should run for city council. And I was like, I got my own issues right now. I can't take on the rest of the cities. And then in 2016, that still hadn't changed, but um, <laughs> one of the issues was rent control. We had just, um, we had passed it in 2015 through the city council that we had, but there was a shady petition that went around that people didn't know what they were signing, and the day it was supposed to go into effect, it got killed. So we had to come back in 2016 to gather signatures all over again in like less than three and a half months to get it on the ballot, and we successfully did that. But of all the candidates that were running at the time, there was only like two that were really supportive of rent control, one that was really, really fighting for it, out of three seats that were going up for uh, council, but there wasn't really anybody carrying a message of like the tenants that I talked to or the issues that I've seen and the groups I was working with was saying, hey, I mean, would you ever consider running for city council? I mean, it's 10 days before filing, so you might not actually win anyway. Uh, but you can at least get your name out there and, you know, try again in 2018. I was like, you know, whatever. I'll at least fight for this. You know, we'll go as hard as we can. I only got three months. So the expectation wasn't really for me to win, but I was going to play like I was going to win and, you know, put into work like if I was going to win. And then I ended up getting the top vote and rent control passed and first rent control measure in 30 years in California's history that went into effect. So... That's just kind of like how this happened, and I just want to continue to build off that work because I'm still a community organizer at the same time while I'm being a city council person, so I'm getting it from both ends and trying to merge the complications and all the red tape in city government and how are we organizing around that and engaging people in a positive way to actually get the things that are impacting them, even knowing we have limited resources. It's just being accountable to that base and the vision that you have and just figuring out the rest because that's all we're all trying to do is just figure it out. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. I think I saw a hand back here. <coughs> traditional space is not working for you or representing your communities and going and building your own systems and spaces. It's, it's so cool. I am curious what you all think about um, one of the mechanisms that folks are now, I think, trying to use to change those traditional spaces, namely the Democratic Party, of primary Democrats and thinking about groups like Justice Democrats working in your state, who's all looking at Cuellar and, and mm -hmm. folks like that. Like, Do you think that's a useful tactic to try and change that traditional Change party or I'm just curious about your thoughts on, on that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, we, we did start engaging in primaries, and it wasn't something that we had done. But I think it's critically important, particularly when you've got those kinds of unique convergence of, like, demographics and, like, you know, just change and then real power opportunities um, to shift that, to shift everybody, right, in the direction that we need them to go. And it's critically important in a state like Texas where that, that is our opportunity, right? We can't win anything at the statewide level. And so that's why we were going down ballot and going into these other hubs. So um, we're, we're really excited about that one in particular. And there's also primaries that are happening. I mentioned our great DA in 2016 who will be primaried in 2020. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of tests, like the, that was our first step, right? Um, and actually our primary candidate lost in that one and we ended up getting behind, behind the one who won. So yes, I think it, we gotta play in that game for sure. Um, I think that uh, it depends on where you are and what the resources are and what the, fun the end game is. I think that you have to ask those hard questions at that time. Do we can we actually do we have the privilege of doing this versus um, you know. It, it just really is a question that I think you have to ask. But I think it's if you can do it, absolutely. We need the best leaders that we can have, and it shouldn't matter. But if, you, but you do have to ask if you have the privilege to do it, if you have the resources to do it, if you have the manpower to do it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks to Crystal, Dewana, and Melvin. It's been really great. Thanks to all of you for your participation. <laughs>